separate His steadfast love who can escape Your faithfulness and endless sea So full of grace and mercy We sing God is so So good Oh God 
I'll just stop in this moment. Let's just think on his goodness. Us in this room and the people who are watching this. When we just take a moment, we just stop and reflect on your goodness right now. The kingdom be the mountain where 
let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anger in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song let the king Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good.
sign We walk in heaven's light We walk in heaven's light And we will see We are so thrilled that you're joining us online again, um, but we are mostly thrilled that we are officially in our new building. We got the keys this week. Um, we got our certificate of occupancy and we are good to go. And we are really, really excited to announce that on June 14th, we are gonna be in our building for the first time. Um, that's not Father's Day, it's the week before Father's Day, but June 14th, mark your calendars. Um, Carol Ann is gonna come in in just a little bit and give us some more information about how we're handling the COVID situation and what that's going to look like for us, but we are so, so excited about being in our new building. Um, in addition to that, we've had a couple of really um, large gifts come in towards our Sweetbriar building campaign. Um, that is still open, and so we are at $15,000 of our $25,000 goal. We've been able to purchase chairs, and we're really looking forward to being able to purchase AV equipment and some new TVs this week. Um, so if you want to contribute to that, you can go online, citylights.cc, and go under Give, and there's a tab for the Sweetbriar campaign. 
We would really love it if you would do that for us. And so lastly, because we're moving into our new building, um, we do have a couple of things that still need to be moved, quite a bit of stuff actually. And so um, we're going to be moving our offices on Wednesday, June 3rd um, at 9.30 a.m. So if you want to come to the office at 25 Sweetbriar Road and you can help us with that, that would be awesome. Um, but we really need the most help moving everything from Camelot into the new building. So if you want to help with that, we're going to be moving on Saturday, June 6th at 9 a.m. You can meet us at Camelot um, and help us move. We've got a U-Haul ready to go, um, and hopefully if we have enough hands, it won't take too long. So um, with all of that, I'm going to hand it over to Carol Ann. She's going to talk to us about what the COVID plan is going to look like. Our COVID team met on Friday, and they have a lot of good plans in place. Um, and we are confident that they're going to be able to keep us all safe. And then after that, we're also going to hear from Sharon, who is going to give us a new look at the family hall. So it's in the basement, um, the bottom floor of our new building. And it's going to be a place that we use for youth and kids and fellowship events. Um, you've probably seen it, but it is finally finished and ready for furniture to be in there. So Sharon's going to give us a look at that as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Ann, and I just have a few quick updates for you from City Lights. We have created a committee to help us get back into the church building as a people group um, the safest way possible. So what that looks like is our committee meets to discuss regulations, to discuss CDC um, articles that have been put out there, figuring out the safest way possible for people groups to come back together, especially where churches are concerned. So we as a committee have already met once this week and we've discussed a few things. Um, the first thing that we discussed is when we do come back together as a people, we do not want to start having children's ministry right off. We want to make sure that we have the procedures set in place for the adult assemblies before we have children's assemblies put in place. So when we do come back in person, we're not going to be having children's ministry right off the bat. The next thing that I want you guys to know is that we are going to be sending an email with a survey asking for the willingness of the congregation. Are you willing to come back in person or would you rather wait until it's a little safer? Either is fine. We just want to know the number of people that are going to be attending so that we can plan accordingly and make sure that we are following um, the procedures and keeping everybody safe at church. So that's just a few of the updates. Um, for you right now from this committee, we're going to be meeting again and we're going to be talking more about the details of what that's going to look like. But we just wanted to um, go ahead and inform you that there is a committee that we're not going to be having children's ministry right off the bat when we do come back. And to be looking out for that email with that survey attached saying whether you are willing to meet in person yet or you would be safer, you would feel safer waiting for a little while longer. Um, so that's all that I have for you guys today. I hope that you have a wonderful day and I will see you soon. Bye. Hi, I'm Sharon Cochran. I'm a deacon and a worship leader here at City Lights. And I'm really excited to come have you join me in this space this morning. This is where most of my dreaming is happening right now as well. This space we call our family hall. And the reason is because we will have gatherings here for every age group in our church. As you've been shown before, there's all these rooms here for the babies, for the young children. The um, elementary age kids will be here every Sunday morning on Wednesday nights. We'll have youth group in here for middle and high school. We'll also be able to have our men's and women's fellowships here and equipping groups. Some nights we'll even have city groups meet in here. So as you can see, uh, this is going to be our family space. And at City Lights, we value creating family so that we can bless the neighbors and take the gospel to the nations. A lot of that will happen right here. So what I want you to do at home today and in the next few weeks is to begin praying and dreaming, how can I participate in making this family space what we know that God wants it to be? There's a lot of ways you can do that. One is giving to our Welcome Home Project, and you can go to citylights.cc and designate your giving for this property here at Sweetbriar. Another thing you can do is get plugged into a city group so that you can come use this space. Come to the fellowships, bring your children, and, uh, and come worship here together as a family. We can't wait to see you and see what God does in this space. Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. To the 
Lord Most High is awesome and the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a song of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Well, hey guys, we're continuing on this Sunday in our series called Strength in the Psalms. And it's pretty cool to think about this. Um, I don't know if you knew that the Psalms were actually all written as we read them today. They were all written back then at a time when Israel was in exile. Uh, they were written at a time when Israel didn't have a home, didn't have a temple to go to to worship. And so uh, many uh, theologians would say that the, uh, the Psalms that we are reading every day for those Jews, those Israelite peoples that are scattered across the nations... Um, th that, that psalm that they read served as a temple. The psalm was actually a temple, a home away from home as they were scattered um, under, under the Assyrians and under the Babylons. It was, it was a way to go to temple without having to go to temple. And I just thought that was interesting as we kind of have moved through psalms one at a time during the days and during the Sundays. Uh, it has been a home away from home for us. It's been a way to worship um, in our homes when we can't gather in the, in the public temple kind of space. Uh, and so we're always just interested in each and every psalm. God, how are you going to reveal yourself? How are you going to reveal yourself in Jesus Christ to us? And it's just exciting every single time to, to look at different psalms and see his character give us strength, just as he's always been giving the people of God strength in times of exile in all seasons through his character. And uh, Lord, that we just might find strength in you um, today and encouragement. Uh, the, the character trait of God that I see in Psalm 47, if you want to go there, is Psalm 47 is revealing that God uh, is a God of Pentecost. He's a God of Pentecost. And that's actually this Sunday we celebrate in, in church history, Pentecost Sunday. And what I mean by that is that God is the one who comes to live in us. The Israelite people always knew that he, he was somebody that lived uh, for them and he was always with them. But he always lived in the temple. He always lived in the box. And so Pentecost represents this time when the Holy Spirit would fall and he would make temples of us. And he would come and dwell and live not just around his people, among his people and for his people, but within his people that his temple, his temples might have hands and feet and live outside of the box that would be portable in every, every neighborhood and nation. And that is what uh, Pentecost Sunday um, is all about. I don't know if you've been watching uh, the Last Dance documentary. As you could probably guess, I've just been so excited and riveted by the television, you know, Michael Jordan documentary that's come on every Sunday. It's now over the 10-part series that just finished up a few weeks ago. And one of the people that you get to meet, uh, tell stories in the middle of that documentary, is his kids, uh, Jordan, Jeffrey, and Jasmine. And I found this quote, I thought it was pretty cool, from Jasmine uh, Jordan. She was born in 1992, so I guess that makes her 28 years old. Uh, she shares this quote um, with CBS Chicago. She says, I was so young when all this was happening. Uh, she's talking to her dad. She says, man, this is who you are in other people's eyes when you and your brothers have only viewed you as dad. Now it's like, okay, I get it. I really understand why you are the goat, the greatest of all time. I really understand now why you're the goat and everyone is so fascinated with you. I mean, this is what she tells the the reporters as she talks about you know her history and growing up in the Jordan household, like she didn't even know who he was until after he she, he retired. The kids would talk about it, the teachers would talk about it, the parents would talk about it. like she didn't get like who Michael Jordan was. She knew him as dad, but she's like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize my dad is the goat. I mean, what a revelation to, to see that and find that out on Google. Um, the songs of Zion, which are like Psalms 46, 47, 48, round about there, are these songs that are reminders and revelations that the God uh, that they worship, the, the Yahweh that was going to dwell in Zion, that temple in Jerusalem, was, was, was making that temple, that throne where he could rule, not just over Israel, but over it all. <laughs> he was not just the God of the, the people of Abraham and Israel, but over all the nations. 
And so this is this kind of mind-bending thing for the, the Israelites as they remembered back to the covenant that Abram was not just going to be a family that was blessed, but a family that would bless the nations, is that they were continuing to review, oh my goodness, like the one who we serve and seek is not just the God over Israel, but he is the God over all of the nations. What a curious picture for the Israelites. Sometimes they would forget and sometimes they would struggle to even believe. But this is who Yahweh was revealing himself to be. In Psalm 47, this is how he's described. It says, verse 1, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord most high, the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us and peoples under our feet. And he chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob in whom he loved. This is the picture that the, the God they serve is not just a tribal God in some enclave of power where there's other tribal gods. He is not even just over all the other tribal gods. He, he is, as, as, the first, as the Ten Commandments and many other places in, in the law of God, the Torah of God command, he is the only God. He is the only one true living God. One of the prophets would say, that piece of wood that they carved that sculpture out of, you know, they'll make fun of it because the prophet's saying, yeah, the same exact piece of wood that you use to, you know, grill your steak in the, at nighttime, you're going to use that to carve up and then you're going to worship it. That makes no sense because there isn't actually several gods. Like if there's one true living God and this is the one that we're worshiping and it's over all the nations. I don't know if you've ever been um, a part of uh, maybe like a recording of like a television show or a game show or if you've ever seen something like that. But um, uh, as, as you look at, you know, some of the verbiage here of clapping, um, you know, there's jokes that Jerry Seinfeld, I mean, obviously tells that have voluntary laughter within, you know, the seats of the people that, you know, you're watching and the audience of the, you know, the sitcom that's being being recorded. Uh, but but they also have this this sign bar. Have you seen this? This sign bar where it would say applause and, you know, during the game show or whatever Jerry's doing, you know, you got to clap and you got to laugh to make sure that everybody's kind of like on the same page. Uh, what's what's phenomenal to me, what's what's astounding to me is in verse one, it, it talks about that the nations are going to come up under this one true king, this this the, uh, Yahweh, the, the king over all of the nations, and they're going to clap their hands and they're going to do it with joy. I mean, this is crazy, right? Like I, I have a problem and you probably do too, if you have more than one person living in your house to get even two people on the same page voluntarily is quite a task. But to think about Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation under one God going one direction, responding to him, not out of demand and coercion, but out of desire. They're, they're responding to him, not because there's a sign bar to clap, uh, because they have to, but because they want to. It says in other parts of the scriptures that he is, he is the desire of the nations. He's the king that, that every nation needs and every nation wants. And if they were to see him for who he is, they would voluntarily clap and respond. I mean, just think about that for a minute. The angel came uh, during the Christmas nativity. Do you remember what the angel told uh, his audience? He said, hey, fear not, fear not. I've come to, to bring you, I've come to bring you good news. I've come to bring you good news. And not only good news, um, but it's good news of great, great joy. It's like, a, it's like an emotional, like, like, like people will respond to this news. Like it's gonna be, it's not gonna be like something that you go and okay, follow and check the box. It's gonna be something that erupts out of your heart. There's gonna be a joy that comes out of it. And not only is it good news of great joy, but it's gonna be good news of great joy for all people. This is the, the, the gospel, right? The, the good news of Christmas in all seasons is that, that Jesus has come to be king of all people. And that is good news of great joy for the rich, for the poor, for different colors, for different socioeconomic statuses, for different periods of history, for different intellectual understandings and capacities. This is good news of great joy for all people. Is the gospel as it is preached to you and as you preach it to yourself and others, is it good news or bad news? Is it news of great joy or great sorrow? Is it voluntarily celebrated? And is it for all people or just your people? Is it good news of great joy for all people? Is it, is it the message that, that God loves the world, that he sent his only son, that who'd ever believed in him, in him would be saved? that he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. All too often I hear the gospel as it's preached and as we live it sometimes, 
that it's not that God so loved the world, it's that God so hated the world that, that he wanted to destroy it. No, 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 no. God loves the world, and so he loved it, and he loved it so much that he sent his only son that the peoples of, of, of the earth would not be coerced, but they would voluntarily interrupt in joy all people, all nations, all tribes, all socioeconomic statuses, clapping. This is the picture that we get in Psalm 47. Verse five, it says, he ascends. This is the picture. He ascends amid the shouts of joy and the Lord amid the sounding trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to the king. Sing, sing praises. This picture of ascending and then this erupting joy that, that comes out of it. The word ascending in this passage is, is kind of a contrast word to this other spot in the Bible in Genesis 11 where it says that God descended upon the peoples and the nations. If you remember in Genesis 11, we actually preached about it a couple months ago in our series in Genesis, was the, the chapter about the Tower of Babel. And the people had united themselves, all the nations under one common interest to build up this tower to make a name for themselves. And it says that God kind of came down, you know, like what's going down, down on down here that's all this commotion. It says that God kind of came down and it said, although, you know, he, he, he desires that there would be a, a reuniting of, of heaven and earth and all peoples would be one, it would not be around the arrogance of man that they might be gods, but it would be around the Holy Spirit, that he would be lifted up and ascended. And so the scripture says that he comes down and he visits Babel uh, and, he, and he, he scatters the people. He scatters the nations and he confuses the languages into all these different tribes and tongues and nations. That's how the nations came about is that they were gathering around themselves. And so he says, if we continue to do this, that we're gonna allow them uh, to dehumanize themselves and, and, and become something they were never created to be. And so he scatters them all, all throughout the nations. But look at verse five. It's not a picture of God's descending. It's a picture of God's ascension. It's a picture of a resurrection. It's a picture of him being lifted up. And in Ephesians, it says that in his train, he doesn't subdue his captives, but he leaves gifts to his church that it might uh, grow each other up in truth and love and build you know, itself up until the stature of Christ. So the picture of the ascension um, of, of Jesus leaving in its wake this, this, this newfound unity for the people and unity for the nations. This is the picture that we see uh, of Psalm 47. And then it says, uh, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham. This would just be such a, such a paradox for them. That the nobles of these other nations, like the king's, of these other nations that didn't belong to God, not part of the covenant, not part of circumcision, we're gonna to belong to the family of Abraham. Like it's just, it, it would have to be given the faith at that point, what, what this would actually look like. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. How do you, how do you, how do you get all nations to voluntarily out of good news and great joy and all people how do, you, how do you align them to clap for joy under one king? How would, you, how would you ever do such a thing? The nations had been scattered to so many different places and so many tribes and, and tongues and, and there's division within the is Israelite camp. I mean, have you been to an airport before and heard all the different languages? Have you ever been in a country before where there's a language barrier and a culture barrier? It's, it's very disorienting. You don't, know how to, you don't know how to communicate. You don't know how to talk. You don't know what they're thinking. They don't know what you're thinking. And it's way easier just to kind of duck your head and pass by, you know, in the hall. And even in your own family, like men and women, husbands and wives have difficulty getting on the same page, moving as one, clapping for joy, you know, for the same thing and for the same direction. But this is the picture. This is what they are promised in Zion, in Jerusalem that there'd be a coming king, an enduring king in the Davidic covenant, that it would be a place for all tribes and all nations, that he was the God, not only of Israel, but of all people. We're gonna turn to Acts chapter two. And uh, the reason why we're talking about Acts chapter two is because God is a God of Pentecost. 
And this Sunday, the 31st, marks the church calendar when we celebrate that God is not only dwelling around his people, but dwelling inside of his people. And he's making temples of his, his people. He is, he is getting out of the box. He's going portable in you and me. And the Holy Spirit is going to descend on all people that, um, that we might see the nations gathered to himself. This is what it says in Acts chapter two, if you want to read with me. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. God, God was not just around, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They, the, the, the Holy Spirit began to live in them. And they began to speak in all of these other languages, all these other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to do. And so this is the picture. They were gathered in that room. They were told to wait by Jesus at his ascension for the Holy Spirit to come, that they might be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all of the ends of the earth to fulfill all of these prophecies, to be a blessing to the nations. And here comes the Holy Spirit, not the way he came the first time to scatter the nations, but to dwell inside of his people that they might be able to speak in tongues that they didn't even understand to gather the nations back to himself. The desire of the nations in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, drawing people to himself. Verse five at Pentecost, verse five. So they were staying in Jerusalem and God fearing Jews, catch this, from every nation under heaven were there. Do you think God is sovereign? Do you think he's in control? He had this scene that he had already laid out that all these other tribes and tongues that had, had come and converted into Judaism and become Jews, they're all gathered in this spot at one time that he might show off his plans, his purposes within the people of God through Pentecost. It says in verse six, and when they heard the sound, the crowd came together in this be bewilderment. And this is the bewilderment of the Jewish people. How can you get tribes and tongues and nations to come under one, one headship, one king? And they heard the sound and a crowd came together. They're bewildered because each of them heard them speaking in their own language. This is the Holy Spirit. He's speaking in, in every language. He is, he's desiring and he is the desire of every nation. And so they're speaking this language. They're amazed and they say, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? This is a region in, uh, in, the, in, in the Jewish um, areas. And in verse eight, it says, then how is it that each of us hears them in their own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, uh, Cappanicia, um, Pontus in Asia, uh, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. In other words, everywhere. How is it that they are hearing with their ears this language? that God is gathering all these people for great joy, for good news, for all people. He's gathering what was scattered in the earth. And, and then Peter preaches this gospel and it's not, there's no applause bar. There's no forced sword or coercion. There's a voluntary repentance, a, a Holy Spirit that falls on all f flesh for the repentance of sins and Pentecost comes. And it says, it says, listen, it's, it's like, it's the rich, it's the poor, it's the Egyptians, it's the Medes, it's women, it's men, it's all people begin to, as Joel 2 talks about, the old and the young, and even the poor among you will begin to prophesy, will begin to have access to the presence of God, not just the Jews, but all people gathered underneath King Jesus. This is who he is. He's the God of Pentecost. He's the one that has come to live in me for others. I remember when... Uh, I first got an iPhone. Do you remember when you first got an iPhone? Changed your life. It was like amazing. I had an iPhone 3GS and everybody was like, boy, you got a 3G? And I was like, no, I got a 3GS. I got a 3GS. The 3G, the S meant you could copy and paste. Like all the other iPhones, you couldn't copy and paste uh, in there. And I could copy and paste whatever words I'd want to. And this thing, man, I didn't even have a service to it. My buddy from LA sent it to me. He paid like 800 bucks for it back when they cost 800 bucks. And you know, he, he sent it to me. And so I just used it for Pandora. I called it my praise pocket. I'd put it in my pocket and it would just play music wherever I went. And I was just plenty of stuff. I mean, the camera was right there. I mean, this, I mean, this was mind blowing for me to, to be able to go, go portable with basically a computer everywhere that, that you went. 
And then I remember I got an iPhone 4 and it was the first time that we hadn't, hadn't got the, you know, the plan and got it activated. I mean, come on now, like when you're that 15 year old kid and you remember when you first got that thing and it like wound that little circle and a dial and then you were activated, like you could go anywhere and yeah, you could take pictures before, but now it's like, you could just like do whatever you wanted to. You could like a Facebook post. It was a miracle anywhere you wanted to. You were portable, you were activated. And then, and then, and then, my buddy, uh, one of my students at Southside where I used to teach, taught me how to jailbreak the phone. Anybody out there jailbreak a phone? I jailbreak broke my iPhone 4, okay? And this is why it was a big deal, because back then, back then, it wasn't until you jailbroke the phone that you could use it as a hotspot. Dude, we have a hotspot. You know, you can click on settings right now, and you can, you can look. There's a hotspot button that allows you to broadcast you could broadcast your signal and anybody, anywhere, like you could be in the car answering emails in the, in the passenger side on your laptop because you can hotspot off of your phone as you're driving down Woodruff Road. This is the, you know, the technology that, that we live in today. And before the Holy Spirit came, uh, there was only one place that you could, you could encounter the presence of God. There was only one place you could gather around the presence of God. That was in the temple. That was in the Ark of the Covenant. But what happened at Pentecost, what happened at Pentecost is that God's Holy Spirit came down to live not just around his people and amidst his people, but in his people. This is who he is. He's the God of Pentecost. The God who resurrected Jesus, his spirit, that God lives in you. He doesn't just live around you. He lives in you. That's, that's where he lives. There's fire, the, the, the fire that represented the presence of God, reminiscent of, of the days of Exodus. Like, it's the fire that was above every single believer. God was going portable. And whereas, whereas the temple was the only place to get to God, now each and every believer became this place, this, this place where heaven met earth and they became hot spots for his presence. And before, before this, before the, you know, the, the, the curtain was torn, there was only one spot that was the holy of holies. That was called the hot spot. That was the place where God's space and man's space was together because it was, it was created pure. But now because of the blood of Jesus and faith in what he did uh, on the cross and his resurrection, now these people were made holy as he is holy. And they, 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 what was true of Jesus became true of them. And so then the Holy Spirit um, didn't tell them to go somewhere to visit his presence. They became carriers of the presence everywhere they went. How does, how does one king gather all nations unto himself, every tribe, every tongue, every nation? How does one king gather people to great news, to great joy for all people? How does, how does he do that? He does it through Pentecost. He does it through his presence living in us for others. This is what Pentecost means. This is what God, this is who God is. He desires the nations and he has the desire of nations. He's calling all nations to himself. And this is something that is impossible for any of us to do, but only possible through the blood of Jesus and his kingdom that comes through his spirit living in his people. What is Pentecost? Pentecost is God's presence living in me for others. This is what we celebrate. We think about Pentecost sometimes in the denominational terms. We think that Pentecost is the birthday of speaking in tongues. And speaking in tongues is a wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, as is prophecy and healing, as is leadership and comfort and hospitality. But the Holy Spirit is not just here to give us gifts. He is here to make us living, walking temples everywhere we go. This is what Pentecost means. Pentecost is just not the birthday of the gifts. Pentecost is the birthday of the church, the birthday of the nations beginning to be drawn to him. We are not just uh, going to some building somewhere, some temple that we can maybe get a touch, a glimpse of his presence. No, 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 no. We live as temples of God, walking, talking, portable hotspots of his presence everywhere we go. And so as you reflect, I wonder what you would think about this question. God is, God is in me for me. He's in me to comfort me, to lead me to all truth, to sanctify, to be, make me like Jesus. And he's also in me for us, that we might be built up for the church. But he's not just in me for me and not just in me for us. He's in me and us for others. He's in me for the nations. He's in me for neighborhoods. He's in me for, for everywhere I go that I might be a hot spot for his presence, that I might be a place where heaven and earth meet. Do we think about Pentecost this way? Do we realize the power, the authority, and the responsibility of being carriers of his presence everywhere we go? 
I want you to think about this question. If you were to reflect about the nature of your relationship with the Holy Spirit, do you know he lives in you? Do you know that he's in you for others? When you think about your relationship with the Holy Spirit, do you think about your relationship with him as something that is for you or something that is for others? Just as as a first gut reaction, like when you think about your prayer life, do you think that that vertical transaction, the ability to talk freely with the one that made you, the, the, the king of the universe, is that conversation like fundamentally about you or is it for others? When you think about like, like your gifts, like your talents, like you've got gifts and you've taken the Myers-Briggs maybe or the Enneagram and you've got certain five-fold gifts. Maybe you're more prophetic or evangelistic or a teacher or a pastor, you know, or apostolic. Like, is that thing for you to build a business and a family and a life for yourself or is it that he might get the nations as his inheritance? We're fundamentally missing it if we think that Pentecost is for us, Pentecost, it's for others. Pentecost is for the nations. When you think, when you think about your, your family, when you think about your children as you raise them and you send them to school or you send them to sports, like as you raise them, are you raising them when you really think about that for, for their future and their college and their potential? Or, or is there also a conversation that if and as they are saved unto Jesus Christ, that they have the Holy Spirit living in them, that they might be for others, for the nations to come to him freely and voluntarily? Man, do we get a picture of even this building like that we're in? I mean, I, I really just feel, you know, this sense of celebration and joy and privilege to be here. But I also, maybe you do too, this responsibility that what a gift this is. And, and every time we get a gift from God, we can see it time after time in the scriptures. The test is always this. Will we keep the gift for ourselves or will we give it back to him? The way Abraham gave his son Isaac. This is the test that we always get. When we receive something good from God, we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to keep it for ourselves or are we ready to give it back to him that we might receive our next gift from him? They're all gifts and we're just stewards and we don't own them. And and so man, may we use this building to grow and gather, to be built up onto the stature of Christ that we wouldn't be like waves passed around like, like doubts, but we've built up onto the headship of Christ. But man, that we wouldn't stop there that this building would become a place not just for us, but for others, for a place of Pentecost, a place that God might be in me and in us for the nations to get their desire in him. And so I just sense that this scripture and really this day is a reminder. It's a conversation about the kingdom of God. Do we prefer the comforts of our lives for the cost and the, and, the, and the receiving and the inheritance of Pentecost? Do we choose kingdom or do we choose comfort? Pentecost has a cost. Do we choose, do we choose kingdom or do we choose comfort? Kingdom is good news, great joy for you and me. It is righteousness, peace, and joy. This is the gospel. Poor people, sick people, Messed up people, sinful people, get righteousness, peace, and joy in God forever for free just because of faith, just because of what he did for us. And, 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 and Pentecost reminds us, like, there's a cost to, to, to that responsibility when we think about the nature of the Holy Spirit living in us are we prepared to, to be the temple of the living God wherever we are? Are we prepared sometimes to pay the cost of Pentecost? The, the cost potentially of familiarity and the cost of sometimes relationships. I think about our groups, you know, in practical ways. Um, you know, we're... we're real strong on going after discipleship. And what discipleship often means is multiplication of groups. And so every two years, it, uh, groups are both a hello and a goodbye. And not forever, and not that you never see the, the person ever again, but it does put a strain on our relationships, right? Like Jesus, who said in the gospel, spent 50% of his time with his disciples, but the other 50% of his time, he spent with people that were perfect strangers and never gave anything back to him ever. And sometimes forgot to thank him. This was the way of the kingdom. 
It wasn't of comfort or, or just my convenient community. It was also for neighbors and nations and, and it created margin for this. It was, it was exchanging sometimes clarity and privilege. It was going low and becoming a servant to all people, you know, that, that Jesus would say he became a servant to all people, that he might ransom some. That would be the picture is that we would kind of exchange our own understanding. Pentecost is a movement of equality. It's always been about a leveling of people at the cross, that all people would come to Jesus on the same terms by grace through faith alone. And so that means that any privilege or authority or license that we have gets laid down at that place that some would come to him. We might have to pay that cost. That might be one of the costs of Pentecost. But these are, these are wonderful, easy things to lay down when we think about the good news of great joy. Um, I think if we, when we reflect about some of the interruptions that happen in our day and some of the kingdom breakthroughs, the things that we didn't plan, the things that we didn't understand, those true Pentecostal moments when the Holy Spirit falls on us and we might bring good news to somebody else, man, would we want anything else? Would we want it any other way? And so... I just invite you to celebrate him as the God of Pentecost right there in your home. And we'll gather someday very soon, uh, well, June 14th, um, as the Lord uh, provides for it, as we talked about in announcements earlier. But man, I pray that as we gather back into his temple, we remind ourselves ongoing that we are the temple of God and the hot spot of his presence everywhere we go. And uh, this is just a great privilege, a great time to be alive that he would get his inheritance in the nations through his Holy Spirit, in us, through us, and for others. Um, let's just pray and, and, and yield to him as we kind of transition into worship. But uh, Lord Jesus, if there's any walls, if there's any prejudices, if there's any expectations that are preventing your Pentecost movement from moving in us and through us, we pray that we would let them down. We would yield ourselves to your Pentecostal movement the movement of nations, the movement of gathering what has been scattered by pride through your grace and through your cross. And so we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross that you might open up a kingdom of good news and great joy for all people to gather in your presence in your Holy Spirit. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.
till the stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tomb, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame, now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint, by His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free, in the love of Jesus Christ.